I'm Rear Admiral Thomas M. Dyke is retired. In the entire history of undersea warfare, it is doubtful that any submarine ever experienced more bitter frustration or endured so much agony as the USS Perch. A first-class fighting ship, manned by a well-trained and efficient crew, she commenced hostilities with every expectation of a long and successful career. But from the very start, the Perch was dogged by almost every kind of misfortune that could befall a submarine. Her ability to take it and the heroism of her crew is a shining entry in the records of the silent service. On December 10, 1941, three days after the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, Japanese planes struck at Manila. While the attack came as no surprise, the state of unpreparedness is best described by the message radioed by the pilot of a flying boat. Have sighted enemy planes, please notify next of kin. The perch with two engines out of commission had no choice but to limp out into the waters of Manila Bay and submerge. In retrospect, it was an indication of the troubles to come. Two weeks after the bombing of Manila, the Perch, now in fighting trim, was on a maiden war patrol off Formosa. Her captain was Lieutenant Commander David A. Hurd of Pounding Mill, Virginia. The executive officer was Lieutenant B.R. Van Buskirk of San Diego, California. Lieutenant J.G. K.G. Shack of Mount Vernon, Washington was a gunnery officer. And Lieutenant J.F. Ryder of Portland, Oregon was diving officer. All of the officers and men were eager for combat. They got it on Christmas night. What's the normal approach course? 170. Left to 170. All ahead full. Left to 170. All ahead full, sir. Open outer doors forward. Stand by. I've got the TBT on the lead ship, Van. Estimated range 2500. Standing by forward. Outer doors open, sir. Stand by. Shoot! But something went wrong. The last torpedo was running erratically. The rudder, which normally flicks quickly from one side to the other to keep the torpedo on its course, had stuck on full right. The deadly load of high explosive turned around and streaked right back towards the perch. Van, come up to the bridge. Captain, that first torpedo prematured. It's a good thing it did. It was a circular run. Came right back at us. Left, full rudder. All ahead, full. If it hadn't have been defective, we'd have had our first sinking. First circular run I ever saw. It was heading right for us when it broached and exploded about 30 yards away. A fine way to start the war. Yeah. Manila had been declared an open city. Port Darwin in Australia was now the base of operations for the submarine. It was considered imperative that this knowledge be kept secret as long as possible. On the night of March the 1st, the Perch was steaming on a westerly course approximately 12 miles northwest of Surabaya, Java. It was a clear moonlit night. Enemy ship, Captain. Just off the port bow. I see them. Two destroyers. Clear the bridge. Anybody hurt? No, sir. No injuries. Van, check for damage. Aye, sir. There's a hole in the conning tower fair water just above the deck. I don't know whether we can dive. Come on up. We've got to dive. Dive! Dive! <laughs> What's the damage? We took in some water through that hole. But it's sealed up now. Good. The antenna trunk's ruptured, Captain. The radio's flooded out. Better get it fixed. Ben, how much water do we have here? 
I didn't get a chance to get a good fix, Captain. If our position is correct, the chart showed 200 feet. You want a thermometer reading? No, you better not risk it. They can pick us up on their sound gear. Let's get an observation. Bearing. Mark. Range. Mark. 1,800 yards. Angle on the bow, starboard 20. Present course, she'll be in position for a stern tube attack. Make ready the stern tubes. Make ready the stern tubes. And rig for depth charge. Rig for depth charge. Whether we get this fellow or not, the second destroyer will be all over us. Coming in at high speed. Take it down to 180 feet. Ten feet. One hundred forty five feet. And we're in the bottom at 147 feet. All stop. Starting another run. They're going off right over us. We're being pounded into the mud. It's better than exploding below us. This one underneath and that'll be it. What's that? Sounds like a death charge landed on deck. It's rolling off. Must have bottomed before making it set depth. You better go below and see what damage we sustained. See if we can pull it free. Aye, sir. All back, one third. Lost power on the port shaft, Captain. Full voltage ground on both batteries. All stop. Let me know as soon as you've got some power. We'll get out from under this. You just have to sweat it out, son. It's okay, Captain. I just don't like sitting here. The perch got up power on the starboard shaft and after an hour of maneuvering, evaded the destroyers. Captain Hurt surfaced to inspect the damage. Captain, all the antenna insulators are broken. Take a look at the periscope span. Number two was frozen in the well. Yes, sir. Captain! Depth charge fragments. There must be a bushel of them. Yeah. Periscope lenses are broken, Captain. Both of them? Yes, sir. And they're both flooded. Engine room? Aye, aye, Captain. How does it look? Number one main engine ran away on starting. Number four camshaft is broken. Can you get underway? Well, number two main motor is gone, Captain. The starboard shaft is out of line. I've got number two engine on battery charge, and number three is ready to go ahead on propulsion. We can make about one-third speed, but we're going to rattle like a bucket of bowls. Starboard ahead, one-third. Control room. KG, what's the damage? Our depth gauges are gone. That last string broke every one of them. If we have to dive again, we'll be stone blind. No periscopes and no depth gauges. How are we for leaks? 
Well, we got one break, Captain. That second string of charges opened the battery exhaust valve, and the next one reseated it. <laughs> Maybe our luck's changed, huh? Birch was battered, but not out. She had a full load of torpedoes, and her deck guns were intact. Creeping along at one-third speed on the starboard screw, she went looking for revenge. An hour later, with dawn only two hours away, two destroyers, possibly the same two, hove into sight. Captain Hurt made for the bottom 200 feet deep. Stopped all the machinery. The noise from the warp shaft would be a dead giveaway. Unfortunately, she had already been sighted by the destroyers. Why don't they get it over? Emergency lights! The telephone is out. Control room? Control room, telephone circuits are dead. Captain, telephone and alarm circuits are shorted. Set up a relay system. All orders will have to be passed by messenger. The sound head's out of commission, Captain. I can't hear a thing. We're deaf as well as blind. But we're not dead yet. Any casualties? Just some bruises, Captain. Think they're gone? It seems like it, but we'll have to stay down till it gets dark. Conserve all the air you can. How does it look, Captain? Not too good. I don't know whether we can get up enough power to break free of the mud. The main ballast tanks won't hold air. Might just be the vents. Put a man on all 14 main ballast emergency vents to operate them by hand. And pass the word every man is to wear or carry a life jacket at all times. Are you going to abandon ship, sir? Not till we have to. We may never get off the bottom, Van. We're not much more than a hulk. Why the life jackets? We'll help the men to think we're going to make it to the surface. They need it. Throughout the daylight hours of March 2nd, the perch lay in the mud 200 feet down. She was badly injured and hemorrhaging internally. The barometer in the boat was smashed and no one knew the pressure. But the perch was not yet dead and the ship's company was not ready to give up. Orders had to be relayed by messenger. There was a 240 volt ground on both batteries, but power was finally returned to the starboard shaft. By going ahead and astern at maximum power on the starboard shaft, the submarine was broken from the mud. Brace your feet, like this. Now get a hold of his legs and hang on. Mr. Van Buster, what are we doing this for? With all the air leaks, we've built up tremendous pressure. When that lets go, he's going to take off. All right, crack the hatch. damage. She's dead, Captain, that's all, just dead. Keep at it, son. There are two other boats in the area. If you could get a message out, we could do the best you can. Captain, the well, deck guns are useless. And KG says that none of the tubes can be fired. We can't fight and we can't run. Steer a course due north. See if the auxiliary engine is capable of putting some charge in the battery. We're going to have to make a trim dive before sunrise. We've got to have time to puff the bilges, Captain. The water in the engine room is almost up to the generators. Six hours. That's as long as I can wait. 
wounded submarine crawled through the night making a bare five knots. Steering, of course, was impossible. The rudder could be moved only with difficulty to the left, and as it reached the midships, it would snap over quickly to full right. Hull leaks were so bad, the bilge pumps worked at full capacity. The crew worked frantically in the half-darkened ship. The perch was no more than a broken iron pipe, but she would not give up. They didn't know if it was possible to dive, or if once down, they'd ever surface again. But unless they could submerge by daybreak, capture was inevitable. At 0400, Captain Hurt ordered a running dive. Heavy, I can't hold it. Blow all ballast tanks. Blow all ballast tanks. Blow all ballast tanks. Captain, the cutting car had failed to see. We're shipping water. The hatch is bent. There's a half an inch opening. All right, open the hatch. Look out to the bridge. working on it, Ben. We've got to make it seat. Yes, sir. Captain, engine room hatch won't seat. Water pouring in. All right, son. We won't need it. We're not going to dive again. The submarine could not dive and on surfacing could not bring a stern out of the water. Only the forward half of the deck was exposed. Of course, was erratic and water in the engine room bilges was up to the generators. It was only a matter of time before she lost way completely. The perch was a dying ship. I don't think we can keep her up much longer. That's pretty certain, Captain. If we have to scuttle, make sure every vent is open. We've got too much secret stuff to let her be captured. KG, get a sack for the code books and ciphers. All right, sir. Torpedoes can't be fired. The deck guns are out of commission. We can't even dive. There's no use in just waiting to get killed. Captain! Three destroyers. ship. All hands, abandon ship. When I give the signal, pass the order to open all vents, then get up on deck. Open all emergency vents! Open all emergency vents! Everyone out? All out, Captain. When you hit the water, don't panic. Your life jackets will hold you up. Swim clear of the ship, but try to keep together. You'll all be picked up. Good luck. I don't think those aft vents got opened. Where's Cajun? He's gone below. All the vents were open.
Ben, they're going to interrogate us, so don't mention Darwin. Good evening. You're the commanding officer? Lieutenant Commander David Hurt of the Perch. I have a few simple questions I must ask. Understand? What is your home base? Manila. But Japanese troops have occupied Manila. They hadn't when we departed. And you've been at sea ever since? That's right. Please draw your course on the chart, Commander. I don't think this is completely accurate. That was our course. Do you know what that means, Commander? I got a pretty good idea. Then write in the dates. Only two of them. That's all I'm going to write. What do you mean by that? Don't you remember the dates? I remember them, but they're the only two that matter. December 14th, 1941, the date we departed from Manila. And March 3rd, 1942. That's today. That's right. The day the perch was lost. I'll be back in a moment with our special guest. You have just seen the nightmare of the Perch, a ship that despite the heroic efforts of her crew was plagued with bad luck from the start. We have with us Commander B.R. Van Buskirk retired, who is her executive officer. Van, I'm sure everybody would like to know what happened to the officers and men of the Perch after she went down. The entire crew got into the water safely, although we never thought Cagey's shot was going to make it. I believe that as a result of your report on Cagey's actions, he was awarded the Navy Cross. Yes, he was, and he deserved it. I never saw a finer example of raw courage. I don't think anyone will dispute that, but possibly only a submariner would ever appreciate the courage it took to go back into an already sinking ship. After everyone got in the water, what happened? We were all picked up. I was interrogated just about in the same manner as a skipper. I got this business, too. Did they ask you to chart your course, too? They did, but they made the mistake of unrolling the same chart. I had only a second glance at it before one of the Japanese officers grabbed it. But it was enough. The course I drew on the fresh chart couldn't have been more than a quarter of an inch off the one the skipper drew. Captain Hurt must have been pretty worried that your courses wouldn't jive. I think he was. But there was one thing about the skipper. The rougher it was, the more quiet and calm he became. I had enormous admiration for Captain Hurt. He was a big man. Did the whole crew get home after the war? All but five who died in prison camp before the war's end. It must have been a terrific ordeal. Van, I want to thank you for being with us. I thank you, Admiral. Be with us again when we bring you another dramatic and true story of the silent service. Take your dog and walk it by Through the deep blue underneath the ocean We'll control the ocean's wide From down, down underneath the sea Take the course to pass the word In the future's yet to be That we we'll say as long as Underneath the ocean, 